Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you for your attention. I'm really happy to see so many people interested in Ukrainian topics. It's quite quite uh, exciting. Even though I would prefer to have different reasons for 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 talk uh, today, but unfortunately we have we have a war and we have to discuss uh, the roots of the war, the uh, its uh, current uh, uh, current affairs, and of course some some prospects. Uh, you have uh, the topic of my lecture on the screen, and uh, it contains all uh, the main messages, all the main uh, problematic uh, issues which I, I'd like to, to discuss today. So, um, essentially, I, I'm going to answer two uh, major questions. One of them, why uh, questions which are very often asked uh, by different people, and uh, people ask even themselves. Why, uh, first of all, why Ukrainian state, which was considered uh, very uh, dysfunctional, uh, corrupted, hopeless, uh, uh, very weak, uh, and uh, sometimes was depicted even as a failed state, uh, suddenly appeared so <coughs> quite strong, quite, quite uh, resilient, uh, quite viable, uh, despite all these expectations. And also by Ukrainian society, which was also very often depicted as divided, you know, for different regions and languages and ethnicities and all that. Again, this allegedly divided uh, society appeared to be quite unified, uh, consolidated uh, as never before against uh, external aggression. Uh, so this is one, one very serious question, which requires some explanation, because otherwise we would not understand why why Ukraine did not uh, fall down after Russian invasion. As many expected, both in Russia and in the West, that Ukraine would last longer than a few days or maybe a few weeks. Uh, this is a very important question, and it requires very serious analysis. What was wrong with uh, knowledge uh, about this country, probably also about Russia? And the uh, second question, uh, why uh, why this knowledge became so uh, firmly consolidated, so widespread, so internalized, both uh, not only in Russia but also internationally? Uh, what is uh, what is the essence of, of this knowledge? So actually, I would I would proceed uh, along these uh, lines uh, outlined in my topic. Uh, I will uh, discuss first of all why uh, Ukraine was non-existent, why Ukraine was uh, under underestimated, belittled, uh, dismissed completely sometimes, why it was uh, nowhere nation, as New York Review books defined it. Uh, then I uh, give, uh, provide you my hint, my, uh, my explanation, for, uh, my answer to this question, because uh, imperial knowledge was dominant, Russian imperial knowledge, I mean, <clears throat> even though imperial knowledge is very similar in, uh, in all the empires, or former empires, so it's not uniquely Russian, but in this case we will discuss Russian imperial knowledge. Uh, uh, briefly, uh, I'll try to explain briefly what does it mean, what are the main, uh, main tenets of uh, main ideas of this knowledge, main the myths uh, of this knowledge, especially in regard of Ukraine, and uh, how and why it was exported abroad, how it became uh, dominant in the West and became also part of domestic, of American knowledge, of uh, German knowledge, of French knowledge about Ukraine, which is basically the same. It's not much different from, from Russian imperial knowledge. It's the same knowledge, at least phenomenologically, politically, these countries have different attitudes. They have different uh, view of Ukraine, but phenomenologically, epistemologically, it's, it's essentially the same. And uh, then, uh, after I will uh, deconstruct uh, this uh, knowledge, uh, roots of, which I believe is, is, uh, represents the roots of the war, uh, in a way of conclusion, I would uh, speculate a bit about ways of decolonization, uh, ways of deconstruction and of uh, dis, uh, disposal, dismissing of this uh, knowledge. Uh, what, we call, what we may call decolonization. It's a very, very popular term and very, very misused term, but nonetheless uh, I cannot find uh, the better one, so uh, I'll talk about the challenges of decolonization. So, uh, to start with uh, is a very uh, term, Nova Nation, I, I'd like to draw your attention to 
uh, very early publications about uh, Ukraine in Western media. These uh, two examples come from a very reputable uh, intellectual uh, magazine uh, published in the US uh, called the New York New York Books. It's a very elitist magazine of the best intellectuals. Uh, are proud to be published there or to be reviewed there and uh, they as many other mass media uh, re responded to in the 1990s they responded to the emergence of new independent state in the former Soviet Union with some uh, explanatory articles and as you may see from these titles these articles about Ukraine were quite dismissive uh, one of them, which was published uh, in 1992, shortly after Ukraine's independence by Abraham Bloomberg, who was uh, one of the top of leading authors, uh, contributors to the New York New Books, uh, this uh, article was featured as a nasty new Ukraine. So there, there was new country, new Ukraine, and of course it was nasty. Why it was nasty? Uh, he explains, because uh, at the time uh, Ukraine refused to give up uh, nuclear arms, uh, nuclear missiles inherited from the Soviet Union on its territory. So Ukraine uh, uh, could not use them, and it was not operational, but Ukraine required some uh, compensation for, for uh, 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 removal of this uh, uh, nuclear weapon and some uh, security guarantee. So within a few years there was the debate uh, there was very strong uh, American pressure, especially American pressure, on Ukraine to, to give up this uh, uh, weapon to Russia. Why, why to Russia? It's, it's not clear. Today it uh, looks very, very, very uh, stupid. Uh, but at the time, they probably they believed that Russia is a democratic, democratized state, and Ukraine is no bad nation. God knows what, who are there, maybe some you know, extreme nationalists, some crazy. Uh, extremists, so it's better to, to take this nuclear weapon and to move it to Russia. Okay, Ukrainians agreed uh, to do this, but they insisted on some security guarantees, so after some protestations in 1995, uh, the so-called Budapest memorandums were signed by major nuclear states, uh, United States, United Kingdom and Russia, and they guaranteed uh, Ukraine, the unviability of Ukraine bodies, and in this Budapest memorandum they promised not to, not to use uh, force and not to use um, threat of force against Ukraine. Russia was signature also of this Budapest memorandum. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, we may speculate today whether it was a good step and uh, no bad step. Uh, I happened to read recently interview with uh, former American President Bill Clinton and he apologized. He, he expressed open regret that he uh, participated in this uh, arm twisting of Kyiv Kyiv government and uh, forced Ukraine to, to give up uh, nuclear weapon. It was not so bad that they give up nuclear weapon. Ukraine was part of non-proliferation treaty. The problem was that you know, these uh, uh, security guarantees were not properly uh, written, no, not, not properly framed, not, not properly institutionalized, and we see today uh, how uh, they were violated by one of the signatures of this, of this uh, memorandum. So this was a major mistake. Uh, and uh, by the way, uh, Bill Clinton, who uh, in another interview, he also confessed that as early as 2007, um, he had some informal conversation in Davos with Mr. Putin, and Putin openly said then, it was 2007, 15 years ago, he said that uh, uh, I didn't sign this memorandum and I'm not going to respect it. Uh, I believe it was a bad document, so it was very clear signal about his intentions, about his plans, 15 years ago. Uh, so much about you know this uh, nasty uh, new Ukraine. But uh, Nowhere Nation also comes from the same uh, newspaper, uh, Nowhere Nation, why not Nowhere Nation? Because it appeared suddenly from nowhere, yes? <laughs> allegedly without no uh, past history, without no uh, heritage, <coughs> culture, and whatever. It's just Nowhere, nowhere Nation. And it was quite typical for mass media. I just brought here two examples, uh, but uh, titles like this were very, very widespread. Uh, uh, like, uh, for example, uh, Unwanted Stepchild of uh, Gorbachev Perestroika. It's another, another title, another, another definition of Ukraine. Even authors who were quite sympathetic for, 
for Ukraine, like for example Andrew Wilson, a very good British uh, political scientist, he published a book, um, it's a kind of textbook, also about Ukraine. Uh, it had, as you can see here, a subtitle, Unexpected Nation. So it's not as bad as Nowhere Nation, but it was Unexpected Nation. And uh, this, is, this book had uh, four editions, because it was just a textbook, uh, at least in the United Kingdom, but probably not only there. Only last year, the first edition uh, was published without this uh, uh, subtitle. You can see here, the new edition which, uh, removes this uh, uh, very dubious subtitle, Une uh, Unexpected Nation. So Ukrainians finally cease to be un unexpected nations uh, 30 years after independence. Um, so, uh, you know, there are many, I have a huge collection of such examples of such dismissive uh, statements. Uh, but the main problem is that, you know, there are many more uh, wrong, uh, false, uh, confusing uh, statements about Ukraine which exist on the micro level and you cannot correct all of them, you know, because they appear daily in mass media all the time you read some stupid things which nobody notices. Most people read this as, a, as a something, you know, it's, it's printed, it's, you know, it's printed, it's written by uh, reputable journalists in reputable magazine, reputable journals, so why not to, why, why to doubt this information? This is not very important information, it's very, very marginal information, something, something that most people consider uh, of, of little importance, it's really of little importance, but cumulative uh, uh, energy of the statements is very harmful for Ukraine because it's basically it marginalizes the country uh, and uh, belittles it. Uh, here's just, kind of a couple, uh, just a few examples which were, were taken from um, Recent publications, uh, for example, you, you may read how reputable your your books uh, informs readers that the Ukrainian language was derived from Russian in the 16th century. It's absolutely nonsensical. Or uh, reputable Davos, uh, Davos Business Forum, a couple of years ago, informed guests that uh, because they had some exhibition about women in history, so they wrote that Kievan Princess Olga. Uh, was the 10th century Russian princess. Sorry, there was no Russia in the 10th century. You know, she couldn't be a Russian princess. She was Rus, king and Rus princess. That's absolutely different. Just like, you know, to say about uh, some Roman, uh, ancient Rome uh, author or, or personage to say that he or she was Romanian. You know, it's Rome and Romania are very different entities uh, separated by centuries of history and very, very vague uh, relations between each other. But in this case, you know, nobody notices, nobody, nobody draws attention to, well, guys, why are you what are you talking about? What kind of Russian princess in 10th century? And uh, then, you know, you, you can see, you can go to Nobel, Nobel Prize uh, Committee uh, website and find out that uh, Ukraine writer Ivan Franko, who was uh, subject uh, of Habsburg Empire, also Hungarian Empire, he is defined there as, you know, as a, on the official website as a writer from, from Russia. Uh, he never was in Russia. Uh, had nothing to do with Russia. He was an uh, Austro Hungarian uh, citizen. But anyway, uh, dozen books uh, are published, uh, and you probably know some of them about uh, Nick, very famous writer Nikolai Gogol, also known as Mikola Gogol in Ukrainian. Uh, and also, most of them never mentioned that he was uh, of Ukrainian origin, not only of origin, he, was, uh, he grew up from Ukrainian culture. He was very uh, heavily, very strongly influenced by Ukrainian culture. He was forced, he, he had no choice but to write in Russian because it was the only official language, only publishing language at the time in, his, uh, in the Russian Empire. Uh, but you know, to, to write about any book, any analytical book about Vogel, about his, uh, uh, about his work, without referring to his Ukrainian uh, provenance, is something like to, to, to discuss uh, James Joyce without any mention about his Irishness. To say, to, to say nothing about uh, James Joyce, Joyce as Irish, uh, as Irish writer. Uh, so, you know, uh, to sum up this um, brief, this uh, but typical problem, uh, I would say that very few people uh, pay attention to this, uh, to this uh, false information. And uh, even less of them are eager to fight, eager to, to write some protest to noble committee or to, to Davos Forum or elsewhere, because you know, you cannot, 
<laughs> can uh, transform your life into a daily crusade against this uh, f uh, flood of uh, false information, of misinformation. And this, and these falsities are quite minor to, to fight uh, to fight with each other, to, to, to fight against each minor uh, uh, minor lie. Uh, but together, uh, unfortunately, they create some some very very powerful uh, 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 powerful pool of uh, of misinformation. Uh, so. Uh, here we encounter the problem, the main problem uh, encountered by Ukraine, but not only Ukraine. Not only Ukraine is uh, quite typical for so-called non-historical nations, for for the colonial nations. Uh, problem of so-called normalcy, uh, not normality, but normalcy, uh, and uh, you know information which uh, becomes common wisdom, which. Which is perceived as a normal, unquestionable, it's very difficult to fight this kind of information because everybody knows why to why to question, why to doubt something that is well known. We know that you know that uh, that uh, the Earth runs around the Sun. Yeah. So why to why to question this? The Earth is round. Yes, of course we know it. So this this you know the essence of common wisdom. Uh, usually we don't question something that we looks like like normal, something that everybody knows, something that we, is you know multiplied in textbooks and in talk shows and uh, reproduced by by scholars, by top pop stars, by celebrities, by politicians, by journalists. So there is no reason to, to question, to to, to doubt uh, this information. Uh, but we have to recognize that common wisdom is not God-given, uh, it's not scientific truth. It is usually not based on hard sciences, on proof facts or checkable uh, experiments. It is largely based on impressions, opinions and interpretations, and of course it's not impartial. Uh, common wisdom usually reflects specific ideology of those who develop it and narrate it. And it results from specific policies and discursive strategies of those who have enough power to promote it. In this case, in the Ukraine case, in the cases that I intend to present you, we are dealing with a peculiar kind of the common wisdom, which I call imperial knowledge. Uh, in this case, it's in Russian imperial knowledge, but also there are a lot of imperial knowledge. There is French imperial knowledge, there is American imperial knowledge, and they have the same structure. They have the same essence. It is very, very, very well described uh, in, in the cases of traditional empires. It's, it's very well analyzed and descri described already and, 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 and presented. So I, I'm going to draw on this analysis. I'm, I'm going to, to, to employ this theoretical framework developed by, first of all, of course, by Michel Foucault. Uh, his um, theory of knowledge, power of knowledge, knowledge, knowledge as power. But also, of course, Edward Said, he wrote excellent books about, um, called Orientalism, about British and uh, uh, French empires, how imperial knowledge operates in this case. Uh, there very good, uh, very, this is a very good book by Maria Tolera about, about Balkans, how this image of Balkans was created in, in, in the West. Um, very harmful for, for the Balkans, and of course, very, very, very good uh, book by Larry Wolf, uh, inventing uh, Eastern Europe. How Eastern Europe was created in the 18th century uh, by Western uh, philosophers. Uh, so, uh, here's the definition uh, of imperial knowledge, uh, which largely draws on, on the uh, theories of the authors I mentioned. Uh, just before. Uh, so I understand in my presentation, in my analysis, uh, and hopefully in my eventual book, I understand it as a system of narratives uh, which are developed by imperial ideologues, including writers and cultural activists. They contribute a lot to this imperial knowledge, by the way, because they are readable, they are very popular. And uh, this uh, system of narratives uh, aims at two uh, interconnected goals. One of them is glorification of the empire. It's uh, supposedly great universal culture and it's unique 
messianic sometimes role, historical role. And a second goal is uh, depreciation, marginalization or sheer appropriation of cultures of subjugated nations, monopolization of special entitlement to speak on their behalf, to mediate between them and the world. So the result of this is a complete silencing of these nations and making them invisible. This is actually where nowhere nation comes from, because it's a result and product of imperial knowledge. The empire did its best to make nation dominated, subjugated nation invisible. So hence it's of course uh, from nowhere. Uh, my next point uh, that I'd like to, to explain here is uh, how imperial knowledge is produced and disseminated. It's produced and disseminated by powerful imperial institutions throughout centuries. In the Russian case it was like about three centuries, uh, since 18th century and, uh, and until recently. And uh, this imperial knowledge strongly influenced Western media, academia, mass culture, and uh, common wisdom. Suffice to mention that uh, all uh, the American uh, school, historical school, uh, American studies about Russia were developed by Russian emigre scholars after October, after the Bolshevik Revolution, who escaped who moved to, to Russia, and they developed um, primarily, they based, they drew their uh, courses on history of Vasily Kuchevsky. Uh, it was an imperial uh, historian who uh, obviously denied any existence of any nations. He considered the Russian Empire as a sort of nation state and absolutely ignored. Um, his attitudes were absolutely negative uh, towards Ukraine or uh, anybody else. Uh, and this school uh, was firmly established in the United States. It was, uh, there were a lot of uh, pupils uh, of, of these professors, and still today you still may find a lot of textbooks which still very seriously uh, write about history of uh, Kiev and Russia. I will remind you that Kiev and Russia is as nonsensical as uh, ancient Romania instead of Russian Rome. Uh, so, uh, the problem is that uh, this imperial knowledge was promoted, was developed by imperial institutions, not only academia, not only mass media, not only uh, schools, universities, but also it was supported by bureaucracy, by army, police, security services. It was invisible, but very, very strong support. And uh, it uh, became uh, disseminated all over the world. Uh, it was also established, was accepted by uh, international academia absolutely uncritically. And there was, uh, of course, um, uh, I would say, two reasons for this. First of all, because this was uh, the only information which uh, came from, from that side, because all the alternative information was uh, suppressed. This, this is why actually uh, police and secret police is needed in the empire to suppress all alternative opinion. So that to make imperial knowledge the only available knowledge, there is no alternative knowledge because this alternative knowledge is uh, firmly suppressed by censorship, by, by, by security services and so on. So this was one reason why uh, imperial knowledge dominated internationally because there was no alternative. But also there was no uh, alternative, no alternative evolved in Western academia Primarily because, I believe, because uh, of uh, psychological, cultural affinity of all the empires. So for them, this you know, point of view was quite natural. Uh, Western intellectuals were quite susceptible to uh, imperial knowledge because they had similar knowledge about, all, about their own colonies, about all, their, their own imperial tradition. So it resonated with, with Western imperial knowledge. And because of this, it was uh, accepted uncritically as, as, uh, as scientific truth. Um, uh, specifically because uh, throughout the 19th century, until recently, this uh, uh, realist, real politic approach, political realism, dominated international uh, relations, which also facilitated uh, the spread of, of this imperial knowledge. So uh, we uh, uh, received, we inherited this uh, very heavy uh, heavy, very heavy heritage, uh, and um, I uh, already presented you in the earlier 
on in my presentation, I provided you a couple of examples how this imperial knowledge works on a daily uh, basis, how it undermines uh, Ukraine's uh, agency and visibility and sovereignty and ultimately its existence, uh, as we see today, uh, because, you know, uh, Putin's, uh, Putin's uh, uh, invasion was largely based on classic historical arguments. It was largely based on this imperial knowledge. He believed it himself and he made it uh, believable for many people. Uh, and largely, uh, he, he expected that it would largely legitimize um, his uh, aggression. Uh, so, uh, the main idea was that Ukraine is not even a country, so no one nation. It's a very similar formulation, either from Putin or from New York Review books. There is no big difference. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, ultimately, this fantasy, this Ukraine denial, uh, was transformed, eventuated into as we see today, to genocidal war. Uh, the problem is, uh, the, you, you know, the Ukrainian problem is that uh, it occupies a very special place in this imperial knowledge. Imperial knowledge is, as I mentioned, is typical for all uh, Western societies, especially those with colonial, uh, with imperial past. Uh, but uh, not every uh, imperial knowledge is so toxic so uh, damaging for, for the neighbors, so dangerous for the neighbors, especially as we see uh, in the Ukraine case. Ukraine happened to be in the, in the very center, in the core of this uh, of Russian imperial knowledge, uh, a central part of a very toxic imperial myth, uh, which um, established and uh, developed uh, uh, Imaginary uh, continuity between medieval uh, Rus, between medieval uh, political entity called Rus, which disappeared in the mid 13th century, and uh, 17th, 18th century Moscow. So there are two different, very different entities. Uh, there was medieval uh, 10th, 12th century Rus, and there was invented uh, country, invented empire uh, called Russia which was essentially Moscovy, uh, Moscovy which renamed itself, which uh, claimed uh, non-existent uh, continu continuity between, political continuity between Kiev and Moscovy, which claimed uh, 500 centuries of history, which were not uh, Moscovite, uh, claimed territory which also never belonged to Moscovy because it was, uh, it was Ukraine, it was uh, what is today Ukraine and Belarus, and throughout the centuries after the collapse of Kiev and Rus, uh, it belonged to, Pol to Polish and Lithuania, to Polish and Lithuania Commonwealth, and the worst uh, of all, of everything, was claim for identity. Because, you know, if, if this history, history of Rus, was allegedly Moscovite, and if territory was allegedly Moscovite, so these people are probably also kind of Moscovite. Of course, uh, if, you, if you name these things by its proper name, Moscovites, it wouldn't work. Because Moscow, Moscow was a very remote part of Rus, it was on the margins of Rus, so it had no very, very, very vague relations to Rus. But if you rename Moscow into Russia, allegedly derived from Rus, of course, this semantic trick um, legitimizes all these claims to, to history of, of, uh, of Rus, to territory of Rus, and to identity of Rus. So, uh, the worst result of this appropriation was delegitimization of people who live there. Ukrainians and Belarusians were delegitimized. They could not exist. They should be kind of Russians. This was the only way to make this myth viable, to make this continuity uh, real or uh, uh, persuasive. Uh, so, uh, of course, um, from the very construction, from the very moment this myth was constructed, from the very uh, moment the uh, empire was created, Moscow was transformed into Russia, uh, derived from Rus, Russia. Yeah? Uh, Ukrainians and uh, Belarusians did not fit this model. They were just, you know, uh, one and one, they were witnesses of this uh, theft. They should, should not exist. Because, you know, the, the very existence uh, undermined mythology, undermined Russian imperial identity. So, from the very beginning, from, since the 18th century, these people had to be assimilated. And uh, all the imperial policy through three centuries was directed at assimilation of Ukraine.
Ukrainians and Belarusians. In the Ukraine case, it didn't work. And when uh, ultimately uh, Moscow elite came to understand that in case, this case of Ukraine doesn't work, they moved from uh, assimilation policy to Plan B extermination policy. So what we observe uh, today. So uh, uh, I'd like to emphasize once again that you know this uh, Ukraine denial uh, was not just academic problem. As we see today, it became kind of political problem because it legitimizes very aggressive, very cruel, very uh, bloody war. Uh, here, I would like to, to, to draw attention to one more example because uh, just a few days ago I happened to read an uh, article of a uh, Canadian diplomat in Moscow who, well, like many people who have some Experience, Russian experience, they claim to have expertise in, uh, in Ukraine and uh, dare to judge about all developments, about everything. They are kind of self, self-professed experts. And uh, here's just a you know, small, uh, small passage which also I believe most readers would not uh, notice, would not pay any attention to this passage, which is very typical um, for this kind of uh, 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 speculation. Uh, he wrote his quotation, half a millennium ago, the first modern gatherers of the Russian lands found themselves face to face with a technologically advanced and military superior West. Maybe yes, maybe no, but the only problem is that there were, there were no Russian lands uh, half a millennium ago. Half a millennium ago means probably uh, 16th century. There were no Russian lands at the time. There were lands of uh, Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth and Ukraine and Belarus were part of this, and they were lands of Moscow, Tsardom of Moscow. No Russian lands at the time. But people read it, and most people believe that yes, it's true, of course, there was thousand year old Russia. No, sorry. There was no, there was no thousand year Romania, and there was no thousand year Russia. Uh, the only difference is I very, I, 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 I very like this um, uh, comparison uh, because all the time I, uh, I imagine uh, today's Romania, which uh, uh, it can be kind of science fiction book about this, about Romania, which became uh, strong enough, became superpower, and uh, countries also was created in the 18th century, was invented, imagined in the 18th century by intellectuals, uh, and the name was uh, adopted, uh, derived from ancient Rome. So Romania did not exist until 18th century, but it was named after uh, uh, referring to Roman leadership. So, you know, just imagine that this current country suddenly became strong enough to subjugate Italy, for example, uh, to name Italians as sort of little Romanians, uh, dialect of uh, great Roman language, and to claim all the history of Romania to be uh, Rome history and Rome history, history of Romania, and to engage in gathering of all lands of the former Roman Empire. Greater Romania, which consists of all lands of historical uh, Roman Empire. This is something like something what uh, today's uh, Moscow is doing. Uh, luckily, Roman Romania is not. Romania is a nice country, I, I love it. Okay, so uh, the about the consequences of this mismaking. Mismaking, political mythmaking very often often can be dangerous, and in this case, uh, as we can see, especially it's very dangerous, it's very very destructive. Uh, consequences consequences are very multiple, and I can list here only a few of them because there are many more uh, very negative consequences. One of them, of course, was. Uh, failure to understand uh, the Soviet Union as the empire, to predict uh, its collapse, because all the empires sooner or later collapse, and uh, to apply uh, proper policies to the post-Soviet states. There was no reference to the Soviet Union uh, as empire uh, until 1990s. So it was really um, a big problem for, for, for scholars to to discuss this issue, because it was not politically correct to, to label the Soviet Union, to analyze the Soviet Union as an empire. Uh, and, and this is why, why scholars, why politicians failed to predict this collapse, to predict its uh, dissolution, because they simply did not know there are many nations, <laughs> this empire which consists of many nations which strive for, 
for independence. All these nations were nobel nations. Uh, the, the other uh, result, the other consequence was, of course, uh, Russian first policy, which dominated Western uh, capitals for decades, until recently again. Uh, and this policy was, of course, were very harmful for both for Russia and for um, post-Soviet states, Ukraine in particular, because uh, it uh, promoted inadequate policies, uh, you know, inadequate attitudes. They exaggerated uh, developments, uh, so called democratic developments in Russia, and they uh, put blind eyes of, on increasingly authoritarian tendencies in Moscow. And on the other hand, this. Um, uh, Russia first policy undermined all other nations uh, who were denied their uh, European identity, for example, European prospects, and, uh, and so on. Uh, this you know, uh, appeasement, Western appeasement, largely facilitated consolidation of, of rogue dictatorship in, in Moscow and largely, I believe, largely encouraged uh, uh, revisionist. Uh, aggressive agenda. Uh, Ukraine uh, was perceived, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, as a highly corrupt and dysfunctional and almost failed state with deeply divided society. Uh, so this is why today's resilience and, uh, and resistance came uh, as a great surprise, not only to Mr. Putin, but also to most Western politicians. Because they, <laughs> they, uh, they saw Ukraine through the same glasses, through the same Russian optics. Uh, and uh, also today, even today, we have uh, quite quite a few uh, specialists, uh, quite a, a few of uh, Putin fasters who uh, persuade Ukrainians to negotiate, to compromise, to, to succumb uh, to Putin's demands, to help him to spare his face, to avoid humiliation, and, and on and on. I, again, I have a long list of quotation from this office, but it's quite boring, I, I would spare your time. Um, uh, last year there was a very uh, angry cartoon from my Polish author, which probably may be exaggerated, but he, uh, this is how, how he considered these attempts at negotiation with, uh, with a bloody dictator. Uh, and uh, what is common in this, all these uh, calls for compromise and negotiation is a failure to understand that uh, Ukraine wages anti-colonial war. This failure to understand that um, Putin's war in Ukraine is not about territory. It's not about uh, alleged NATO threat or ex expansion and, auto and so on. It's not about that. It's about identity. It's about, as, as I mentioned already, it's about a big black hole in Russian identity, in the very center of Russian imperial identity, which is produced by Ukraine. U Ukraine absence in this Russian imperial identity makes uh, makes a hole, makes the uh, situation very painful. And what we see today is kind of convulsions uh, of organisms which, which, which was harmed by uh, detachment of, of Ukraine, by Ukraine's independence, Ukraine's independent development. This is how we have to understand the war, and this we must understand why uh, it's difficult to, to end, at least as long as this regime uh, in Moscow exists. Uh, that no compromises are possible just because, and Ukrainians perfectly understand this, they understand this matter of their survival. There is no, no, no way in other ways, either to capitulate and to, uh, to agree they do not exist, to accept this notion of no violation or to resist, or to fight, till the very end. So, uh, this war of national liberation, this typical anti-colonial war, uh, national liberation, which was not completed uh, until in 1991, uh, it was uh, stopped halfway, so now it, it is uh, a kind of continu continuation of this. Uh, and, um, as I mentioned already, it's not about territory and about uh, security. It's about freedom, about dignity, and about the very existence of, of the nation, uh, especially in view of uh, Russian open denial of Ukraine existence. In, this, in, Put in Putin's theorizing, in Kremlin theorizing, Ukraine does not exist and should not exist. And this is what, what the war is about. 
but uh, we have also to understand that all colonial wars are sooner or later lost by, by the empires. Not a single colonial war was ultimately won, and the nuclear weapon doesn't help here. America lost in Vietnam, Soviet Union lost in Afghanistan, in Afghanistan. the West coalition again lost in Afghanistan, so there are a lot of France lost in Algeria, and more and more and more. You know, all, all the colonial wars are basically lead to, to defeat of imperial power, because we live in the we, are, we live in the age of, uh, of not, in, not in colonial, not in imperial age. Neo imperialists, maybe, yes, it's another matter, and we can have another discussion about neo colonialism, about, about uh, different forms of imperialism, but uh, not, not these forms of 19th century colonialism which are promoted by uh, today's Moscow. Uh, so, um, uh, I'd like to, uh, to draw here some historical parallels, because this naivete of uh, some Western pundits and politicians is nothing new. They uh, reacted in a very similar way uh, in the 1930s to uh, Hitler accession in power. They were also persuaded to make some peace, and you know they ultimately Western countries made the peace, they betrayed uh, Czechoslovakia and sacrificed Czechoslovakia to Hitler. There was this infamous Munich and, uh, uh, agreement. Uh, here I uh, found more interesting uh, Quotation public, uh, publication in the New York Times uh, in 1934, uh, 1934. It was the uh, uh, second year of uh, uh, Hitler uh, government. And an American professor, a reputable professor from a reputable university in a reputable New York Times, argues here's a quotation by hating Hitler and trying to fight back. Jews are only increasing the severity of his policies against them. If Jews throughout the world try to instill into minds of Hitler and his supporters recognition of the ideals for which the race stands, and if Jews appeal to the German sense of justice and German national consciousness, I am sure the problem will be solved more effectively and earlier than otherwise. We in Ukraine uh, hear very similar advices from the West today. Stop fighting, maybe you know, maybe you would. M maybe your fighting only increases your suffering. So try to persuade Mr. Putin that you, 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 you have a right to exist. Sorry, it wouldn't work. Here is a screenshot from New York Times, and you may find this article. It's, in free, it's free access in the archive. Uh, it was published on the 15th of June 1934. And there are many more uh, this kind of, this kind of articles. It was a uh, very typical naivete of many educated, allegedly educated, educated uh, people. Uh, it cannot go this way in Ukraine. And here uh, is um, uh, here are results from opinion surveys in Ukraine, which are uh, uh, taken recurrently, not every month, but uh, every second month, every third month. Uh, one of the questions is uh, about uh, people's attitude toward the possible compromise, uh, possible negotiations with Moscow. Ukrainians uh, increasingly understand that it is impossible, and you may see this dynamics over here. You may see a uh, uh, minority of the people falling down from 10% to 8%. Uh, this is percentage of people who uh, believe that uh, yes, we, we should uh, we should compromise, we should give up something to Mr. Putin in order to to stop the war. And you see a uh, huge majority of the people who do not believe this. So it's not that they want to fight; they simply understand that it is impossible. There is no alternative. And you can see that how these figures are uh, quite stable. Almost 90% of Ukrainians believe that we have, we have to resist, we have no other way. And, and you also can see here uh, that this opinion is uh, almost the same in all Ukrainian region. So there is no big difference between the West, Center, South and East. Maybe slightly, slight, slightly 
uh, less support for, for resistance. It is, but still it grew dramat dramatically in, uh, even in the East uh, during the war, from 68% in May last year through uh, until 80% in December, and now it's growing. I have new data which is indicates that you know, it reaches 90% everywhere. So uh, it's quite a, quite a broad consensus in Ukrainian society about the need to, to, to resist. Simply just because uh, uh, we recognize that there is no, no other exit. Uh, so um, I believe I explained you the reasons of popularity, uh, of uh, um, uh, uh, internalization of this imperial knowledge. Uh, so now we can come to, to the last, uh, to my last point about what to do, what, what is to be done. Uh, I argued at the beginning that, of course, this imperial knowledge is very harmful, uh, especially in the case of Ukraine, because it facilitates Russian aggression and uh, justifies, at least in the eyes of some people, these uh, territorial claims, territorial uh, requisitions, uh, and Ukraine denial, which is uh, very dangerous, uh, ultimately genocidal. Uh, so, something should be done. Uh, this knowledge, unfortunately, unfortunately is uh, firmly entrenched because it was uh, uh, many generations of, uh, of historians, of uh, humanitarians, of politicians, of uh, philologists, uh, specialists in literature and so on. So, journalists were educated in this way. They acquired this knowledge as scientific knowledge in universities. So, of course, it's not so easy to, to to question it, to to revise it, but it's but it's necessary. I explain you why. Because it's really dangerous. Because ultimately it may result in genocidal war. So uh, it should be done. And of course we uh, we cannot expect very quick, very fast, and radical re results. But nonetheless, it should be done systemically on a daily basis. Textbooks should be revised. Um, all the publications should be done more carefully and uh, we should react, we should react more actively to all these uh, uh, wrong, false statements because they are not that innocent. It's not like, you know, just your uh, mistakes. There are a lot of mistakes in, in mass media, there are a lot of mistakes in uh, popular statements. But not all of them are as harmful as this. Not all of them uh, feed the genocidal war. So, in this case, we should be very careful, and I believe that Ukraine denial should be uh, criminalized as much as, as Holocaust denial, because the results are ultimately the same, very similar. Uh, the probably most, most uh, controversial issue in all this uh, decolonization agenda is, of course, about uh, Russian culture. Uh, I don't promote here a radical st stance which uh, requires uh, total <laughs> Uh, cancelling of it? Probably not. Uh, but on the other hand, we uh, have to recognize two things. That this culture largely supported uh, growth of empire, legitimization of empire, imperial conquest, and still support it. So uh, we have to, to recognize this. That both uh, Pushkin and Dostoevsky and Bulgakov are great writers, but they were imperialists, chauvinists, and uh, xenophobes. Uh, this is another uh, part of uh, another side of the coin, and it should be also said uh, clearly and openly and frankly. Uh, secondly, we probably also have to understand that there is no soft power during the war. All the power, even soft power, works for hard power. All, even soft power supports military advance, symbolically, psychologically, and on and on. This is why sport is not neutral, culture is neutral during the war, and this is why they should be postponed, not cancelled, not, not uh, abandoned completely, but for some, for, for some period of time terminated. And the reason is very simple, because all these uh, things, all the success, uh, cultural or sport successes of rogue state uh, indirectly promote rogue state, add, add something to its uh, symbolic value. It might be Rock's Day, but it has Tchaikovsky, but it has Dostoevsky, but it has something else. Nonetheless, no, it's Rock's Day as the first place, and the second place is Rock's Day. Uh, so, uh, I'd like to understand this problem, because uh, sometimes um, Western intellectuals 
understand it's much worse than uh, Putin's uh, gauleiters. <laughs> uh, for example, uh, here is very, very remarkable quotation from from interview from uh, with Mr. Petrovsky, who was very ardent Putinist for years. Uh, so this is not opportunistic statement. He he's committed to Putin's policy, and in in a recent interview he uh, put very frankly and very straightforwardly, he boasted with uh, his activity, because he's director of Hermitage, famous museum in St. Petersburg, and he uh, boasted, uh, quotation, our recent exhibitions abroad are just a powerful cultural offensive. If you want, it's a kind of special operation, which, is, which a lot of people don't like, but we are coming and no one can be allowed to interfere with our offense. So, you know, he articulates cultural exhibitions of Hermitage, not, not political and just, you know, pure culture, pure art, but he understands much better than Western intellectuals that this is our special operation. And you know what special operations mean, means. We know what it means. It, it means daily killing of Ukraine. So much about culture, which is, I believe, today it's part of the war machine, and about uh, alleged innocence of Russian people. No, I believe that all of them are, or most of them are responsible so, for the war. 90% of them support the war, 90% of them support the government, and 90% of them are responsible for what we have. Thank you for